Um, you remember what the purpose of this class is? To learn. To learn. <laughs> to learn how to do what? Write. Learn how to write. Very good. Okay. My job is to make you be very good writers. And yes, we have to learn how to write essays and those specific types of essays for the AP exam. Um, but to be a good writer, you have to practice all sorts of different types of writing. So we are going to spend the first week or so uh, writing poetry. And why does poetry make you a better writer? It's creative. It's creative. Okay, you, maybe you exercise a part of your brain that you don't normally exercise. Why else, Christian? Increases vocabulary. Increase, it may. Hopefully you use some big words. Um, but it's learning to, and we'll work, we're going to work with specific types of poems to fit into a certain form. Learning to fit words to fit a certain poetic form and learning how to create images and using the right words to create the right feeling or the right image, that makes you a better writer. Okay. So, how many of you, show of hands, how many of you have written a haiku in, in the past at some point? Anybody written a haiku at some point? When did y'all start writing haiku? Fifth grade. Like fifth grade, right? You got, you've got that down, right? Haiku is not a problem. Um, yeah, when, when I say when I say haiku, you say what 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 makes up a haiku? Five seventy-five. Five, seven, five. It's three lines long, right? Easy enough. Um, and we'll go into a little more detail later about what a haiku is supposed to be. Can y'all remember any of the haiku that you've written? No. No. It was that memorable. I wrote one about soccer. One about soccer. I'll yeah, write basketball haiku sometimes. It's very exciting. Um, we are going to write haiku, but we're also going to write a new type of poetry that you probably have not heard of before called shijo, which is uh, a Korean form of poetry. It's also three lines long, but it's a little more complicated. What do those numbers mean, do you think? How many syllables? How many syllables? So each line will have 14 to 16 syllables. So haiku, you only have to come up with 17 syllables. For a shijo, you have to have right around 45. And as we'll see in a minute, it, the form of the shijo makes the meaning of it a little bit different than your normal haiku. So, Leading into all this for the past few years, I have always had my students enter a shijo writing contest. And our goal here is to come up with a contest worthy poem that all of you are required to enter the contest. Right? Now, the good thing about the contest is you get to win prizes. Money. Money, in, in fact. <laughs> the past two years I've had students enter the shijo contest and I've had, out of the past two years I've had three students uh, be prize winners. So again, I expect this year, hopefully, at least one student, right, will be a prize winner. Correct? <laughs> Correct? It's be, it would be like uh, Duke not making the basketball tournament one year, right? They make it every year, so I should have a student win the poetry contest every year. Um, it is sponsored um, by the Sijong Cultural Society out of Chicago that promotes Korean culture um, in America. And all you have to do is write one sijo in English on a topic of your choice. It has to be in English. You don't have to learn and write in Korean. That's good. And uh, we'll submit that through the website. And if you win first place, I've never had a first place winner, $300. Second place is $200. Third place is $100. And even if you get honorable mention, it's still a $50 prize. So are we interested? Yeah. The English class is um, AP Junior English, um, I guess formerly English Language and Composition. So most of the time we spend um, reading nonfiction essays and nonfiction books and writing different types of essays. Uh, but I do like to stop every year and uh, have them write some poetry because uh, cultivating their creative side makes them, makes them better writers, I believe. I like to start teaching um, Sijo by teaching the students something they know. So most students have uh, studied haiku in the past. They've written haiku probably ever since elementary school. So we start talking about 
uh, haiku, another three-line poem. And then I introduce them to Sijo and show them a few examples of Sijo poetry and how it's alike and how it's different than um, haiku. All right, so let's look at what a Sijo might look like. So just three lines long, right? It should be easy. Uh, they have some really good resources on the website here. I think the link is still up on RenWeb. I'll double check that so you can go and, but I'll give you a handout of this in a minute anyway. Okay. It tells us the Shijo is a traditional three line Korean poetic form, typically exploring cosmological, metaphysical, or pastoral themes. About philosophy, about nature, about the universe, right? Organized both technically and thematically by line and syllable count. Sijo are expected to be phrasal and lyrical as they are first and foremost meant to be songs. We'll look at an example in a minute uh, where they actually sing a Sijo. They've been writing these in Korea, I think, since the 1300s. And when they first wrote them, they were meant to be sung. Um, so when it talks about some of these syllable counts here, it is referring to... Um, how they would put, be put together to be sung. Um, there are three lines, and I like how they, they break down the three-line explanation here so you get an idea of what, what it should look like. Uh, it says the first line is usually written in a three, four, four, four grouping pattern. That's three syllables, four syllables, four syllables, and four syllables. We're not, we're not going to stress out too much about the hunks of syllables yet. But the first line states the theme of the poem. It introduces the situation, maybe creates an image, lets us know where we are, what we're looking at. Then the second line, again, similar syllable pattern, is an elaboration of the first line's theme or situation. Okay? So it says something more about what's going on, what the situation is. And this is what I really like about the Sijo. Um, the third line, it has two sections, it has a counter theme, and it says uh, the second part is the conclusion of the poem. The counter theme is called the twist, which is usually a surprise in meaning, sound, or other device. In other words, there's something unexpected a lot of times that happens in the third line of the seizure. Almost, almost uh, outright irony. Wow, I didn't really see that one coming. That's some, sort of what makes seizure fun to write, more than just writing a haiku that's just an image. And they give us a sample here of a seizure. This is, uh, I guess, since he was born in 1587. This is from the 1600s, right? A traditional Korean sejo. So let's look at the first line. You ask how many friends I have. Water and stone, bamboo and pine. Okay, what's, what's the theme presented in that first Huh? It's friends. Friends, okay. Uh, how many friends do you have? A lot. A lot, okay. <laughs> All right. What is this guy's answer, though? Nature. nature, water and stone, bamboo and pine. Okay. Is that what kind of guy is this? A nature person. A nature, is he one of maybe one of those Henry David Thoreau guys who just likes to sit out in the woods? He is a transparent eye. He is a transparent eyeball, maybe. Okay. Then we we'll look at the second line. This is a theme continued. The moon rising over the eastern hill is a joyful comrade. How does that continue the theme? Nature, nature makes him happy. Nature makes him happy. What's what's another one of his friends, Lauren? Other than the moon. Well, well, the moon in in the second line. <laughs> right? Yes, yes. The moon in the second line. That's another one of his comrades. Right. Now, how would you feel if your only friends were water, stone, bamboo, pine, and the rising moon? Lonely. Lonely? Does that does that sound depressing? What? What do you have as friends? Rocks. That, that doesn't seem like a very happy way to look at life. Right? I'll hang out with bamboo on the weekends. Um, but the last line, this is where the twist comes in. Beside these five companions, what other pleasure should I ask? What's, what's the twist there? That he is content. That he's content. You're kind, of, you're kind of surprised that maybe he is content with just being friends with nature. Again, maybe he lives in a little hut out in the middle of the woods, and that's what he likes to do. Well, let's look at, let's look at this seizure and how it's put together here. All right. We'll, 
a lot of times, as we'll see, they'll, they'll take one line and split it in two, kind of like this. We'll look at that as the, uh, as the first line there. Moonlight white on white hair blossoms, the Milky Way in the third watch. Okay, Vetus, we begin with an image. What's, what's the image? It's like uh, moonlight on the meadow blossoms. Meadow, well, what kind of blossoms? Uh, white pear blossoms. White pear blossoms. So white on white. And the moon's been pretty bright recently, hasn't it? You can go outside at night and almost see by the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe this is one of those, one of those nights. The the white moon is shining on the white pear blossoms. Oh, do we have? Do we know what time of year this is? Then? Spring. Spring. A lot of times these traditional poems like this will invoke a season. Right. Talk about nature, and we know what season it is. Well, what's the second half of that line? The Milky Way in the third watch. Nighttime. Okay. What, what does it mean by third watch? That's an odd phrase we don't use much anymore. What's the night watch? Back in the good old days. First watch. First, first. It'd be like the, the third watch would be usually from like the uh, 2 to 4 o'clock, so it's like midnight almost. Yeah, or past midnight. Yeah, just past midnight. Yeah, you, so you'd have a, a guard on watch all night long, and you'd have shifts. So the third watch would probably be the last one. This is really late at night. This is 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, right? So he sees the pear blossoms. He sees the bright moon. He sees the Milky Way. Really, really late at night, okay? And then we get the second line here. How could the cuckoo know that spring suffuses the branch? What do you think the cuckoo is doing? What do cuckoos do? They make noise. They make noise. He's singing. Yeah. So along another image to go along with this springtime image that's created is the cuckoo is singing, right? um, celebrating maybe spring is there. Right. When, when spring comes around, we hear all the birds singing. There's not too many birds singing around these days, aren't there? They're all in Central America, very warm and happy while we're stuck here. Right? Um, and then though, here's the last line. Love, too, is like a sickness. I cannot sleep tonight. Wait, whoa, whoa wait a minute. What's happening? <laughs> Doris, what's, what's happening in that last line? Why is he up at 3 o'clock in the morning? Like, probably thinking about somebody. So he's, he's in love. He loves sick, right? Surely y'all stayed up late till 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, pining, moaning over someone. All the time. All the time, okay. <laughs> the life of a teenager. Yeah, so there's a beautiful scene, but maybe maybe it's not so happy after all. This poor, this poor sap is in love and can't sleep at night, and he's moaning and groaning over his, uh, his lost love. Okay, so here, this is sung in Korean, Korean for three and a half minutes. So if they're going to sing that for three and a half minutes, what do you think they're going to be doing? There's a drawing out those notes. You may be a little shocked by this. Con contain your emotion as, as we play this. Um, and there's traditional instruments. I think there's a bamboo flute and some sort of stringed instrument uh, being played in the back. So we will we'll listen. The second part of the lesson, we looked at um, different examples of Cijo, uh, both uh, classical, traditional Cijo from the 1400s, the 1500s, and even some modern examples. I even showed them a video uh, on YouTube of a Cijo, a traditional Cijo song being performed and sung, which um, I think they found both interesting and a little bit humorous. So that's the um, traditionally the way a Cijo is supposed to sound, right? Very, it's 
You could say that's hauntingly beautiful in a way. You can hear that emotion in that guy's voice. The Sijo is still a popular uh, poetic form in Korea, and they have samples of modern Sijo on the website as well. And we'll even see some Americans here in a moment who have written uh, Sijo poetry. But look at this one. Let's see, let's see how that fits the pattern also. Um, I will write a poem too. Sometimes you can even give your haiku or your shijo a title, as we'll see uh, a little bit later on as well. Okay. Upon, up above the shimmering sea, two or three seagulls are hovering. Is that a good image? Can you all see that? Yep. Yep. Picture that in your mind? Okay. All right, we're at, the, we're at the beach. Rolling, wheeling, they write a poem. I do not know the alphabet they use. Okay, what, what do seagulls do at the beach? Fly. fly. How do they fly? Together. Because sometimes they, they dive and go up and down and swirl around and all these things. So what is he saying in that second line other than they're rolling, wheeling? They, they, they're doing what? Writing a poem. They're writing a poem. Right? The beauty of their flight. Yes, Chris? This English version is translated from a Korean version? Correct? Yeah, that's the Korean. Okay. Because the syllables century. are off. And I was, I was oh, you're counting the syllables, yeah. And as we'll see in a moment with haiku, uh, the traditional Japanese haiku we'll look at, um, when you translate it from the Japanese to English, the syllables won't match up. They're trying to get the right word instead of the right syllable count. All right, so they're writing a poem by their flight, and the poet is, or the speaker in the poem is confused by their alphabet. And then the last line, on the broad expanse of sky, I will write a poem too. What's going on in that last line? Mary, what do you think? Um, I guess like in a different way, he'll do what they're doing, but just in a different form. A different form. Yeah, he'll, he'll just write in a different way. Write in a different way. In a way, the poem is this poem a poem that captures their poem. Yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me give this to you, and then we're going to look at a traditional one um, from one of the acknowledged Shijo masters. This is that first page that has, uh, that breaks down the three lines and what the three lines should do um, in the poem. All right, I want to show you a good example of how uh, these poems can really create a scene, an image, something that you really can see and experience in your mind. All right. So on the back is this poem up here. Again, this is from Chong Chul um, from the 16th century. I guess it's five, um, almost a 500-year-old poem here. All right. All right, what's the, um, we'll get Lasar. will you read the first line for us? A shadow strikes the water below. A monk passes by on the bridge. Okay. All right, what do we see in the first line? A monastery. Monastery? You see a monastery? Maybe it's near a monastery. Something around there. Something around there. Well, what, what is really concrete? What, what's happening there? A river or something. What? There's a river, and we see a bridge, bridge and a monk. monk. And a shadow. And a shadow, right? There's a whole lot of stuff going on in that one image, right? Okay, it's the 1500s in Korea. What what kind of monk is this? It's probably a Buddhist monk, right? A Buddhist monk. Okay. All right. Then the second line, Lauren. We read the second line for us. Stay a while, Reverend Sir. Let me ask you where you go. Okay. Whoa, that's in quotes. Who's who's talking? Is it the monk to a shadow? Whoever's writing, it's whoever's, writing, whoever saw the shadow in the bridge, yes, right? Hey, stop. Let's have a, let's have a chat. Right. And then, wait a minute, there's a twist coming up. Anna, will you read the, uh, the last line? He just points his staff at the white clouds and keeps on his way without turning. Heaven. Heaven? Okay. Why would he point his staff at the clouds? So that's his goal in life. That's his goal. He doesn't have time for it. Just talk and talk. Okay. All right. Let's do this. This will be fun. I need two volunteers. 
Christian, you'll be one volunteer. Esteban, you'll be the other volunteer. All right. All right, bring your, bring your piece of paper up here. That I just gave. Yeah. The one I just gave. <laughs> it will not be a rat. Okay. Uh, who wants who wants to be among the you you're the most. Okay. You are <laughs> you are the observer. Here. We'll put you here. Alright. Right right through here. We're gonna imagine this is our bridge. Okay? Alright. Alright. I, I will be I'll I'll read the narration. Right? You'll do the second line speaking part. And you will act out what is happening in the book. Okay, you ready? You, you, you're channeling your inner monk? Okay. Okay, good. All right, you ready? A shadow strikes the water below. A monk passes by on the bridge. Stay a while, Reverend Sir. Let me ask you where you go. He just points his staff to, at the white clouds and keeps on his way without turning. Alright. I think I really like this Cijo because it does show uh, that classical form, the first two lines, what they're doing, they're setting up the scene, and then we have that twist at the end, maybe that was kind of unexpected. Why didn't he stop? No, most people would stop and say, hey, how you doing? Nope. I'm just gonna keep. So I'm just not, gonna keep walking. So they're not like actual surprises. They're just like yeah, little little unexpected weird. things. It's not like and I woke up and it was all the dream or something. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not. Sometimes it's not that shocking. It's just a little, a little twist, a little turn that you did not see coming. Um, there are even some. Let me scroll down here. Um, written in English, modern American. Rising each morning, I let her into the warm barn. Okay. Okay, what, what, what's happening in the first one? Sounds like you're a farmer. A farmer, okay. What's he letting into the warm barn? Like a cow. A cow or a horse or something, right? I pour oats, clean her stall, then fork more hay into the trough. Okay, we continue the image of feeding the, feeding the animal. Uh, sounds like a horse. It's oats. Don't you, you uh, feed yeah. a horse oats, right? <laughs> then, well, here's the, maybe this is the shocking twist here. When she kicks my hand away, why do I think of my wife? <laughs> That's her. <laughs> See, this would be kind of funny, right? Um, that says something about, unexpectedly, about his, his, um, his marriage, his relationship with his wife. Wife a horse? Yeah, he had better not have shown that to his wife. He may be attracted. Uh, well, there's married a long time. There's always some sort of tension, something. How about this? This is this is a deep one. Carefully, I lifted it from the branch, an empty cocoon. Have you seen that again? Seen like outside, yeah. a little cocoon that's empty. Took it home and mounted it center stage on the mantle. People like to find weird stuff. We all have the empty hornet's nest, you know, in the middle. <laughs> That's at the nature center, right? But then, hear it speak. What does it say of living? What of the dead? That's the one that sort of makes you. Not, it's not funny. It makes you think, right? You don't like it. Why? Why do you not like it? How do you know things dead? It's just. It's okay. Well, it held. It once held. A living thing, right? A cocoon is what? What do cocoons do? Hold things. Protects. Yes. It's Protects. A stage, it's a stage of transformation. It takes stage of transformation. Life is transferred from one thing to the next, and so the life you had before, before the cocoon, is dead. It's dead. It's gone. You can never get it back. Once you get out of the cocoon of high school, you can never return. You don't want to? Okay, good. I don't, well, I say I don't want to go back to high school, but here I am. I'm, I'm stuck here for, okay. <laughs> All right, let's, before, this, this, does this seem kind of challenging to say, okay, you go home tonight and write three Cijo. Come back with on Friday with, with three Wait, poems. three Cijo? Three? Was it, is that, does that sound kind of hard? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yes. Maybe we should start at a 
one haiku. A simpler, <laughs> a simpler place, maybe a more basic type of poetry. Okay, let's let's think about what a haiku does. What do haiku do? Describe. Describe. A traditional Japanese haiku is based on what? Nature. Nature. And it's usually written in what, what verb tense? Present. present tense. I think most of these Cijo have been written in present tense too, so I think it's a good place to start as well. And what the way I like to think about a haiku is a haiku is almost like a snapshot of nature. It captures a moment in time. Right? It's like if you look out the window and then you see that scene in nature and you try to write it down and describe it in 17 syllables. Um, instead of going out there, just click. There it is. You've got it there on paper. And so it, you're not trying to say necessarily anything deep or funny or even ironic. You're just trying to describe something. Okay. So imagery then becomes the basis. I think imagery is really the basis of all poetry. You've got to create an image. And so to create that image, you really got to think about the words you use. What's, what's that fancy term? That's not too fancy. We use first semester when we talk about authors and words. Their use of what? Diction. So you really have to think about your own diction to create a haiku. So I have a book. I don't want to offend you. It, it is my haiku picture book for children. You're still technically children, right? None of you are 18 yet. Uh, but what it does, I, I like it. It takes classic haiku from Japanese haiku masters, translates them into English, and again, sometimes the syllables won't match up. Um, but then they come, come up with an illustration for that haiku. But before I show you the illustration, right, um, I want you to see, I want to see if you can picture the image the haiku makes in your own mind. You might even want to close your eyes as I read. Sounds good. Okay, no, no sleep. <laughs> just, just eye closing. All right, I'll, I'll, the people who have their head down in the back, I'll ask them first what it, what it says. All right, listen to this one. Fly away, fly away, little baby sparrows. Here comes Mr. Horse. Petus, what, what, did, what did you see? I was just imagining a horse running after birds. Running after birds? Okay, where are the birds? In a field? Would the horse be in the middle of a field? Well, the way they have it illustrated is they've got the horse coming down a road and the sparrows are right in the middle of the road, right? So you've got to get out of the way. Get out of the way. Okay. All right, here's another good image. This is not, not quite as playful. Let's see if you can, in your mind's eye here. A sea of yellow flowers. In the west, the setting sun. From the east, here comes the moon. That's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, what, what did you see? What's what's there? A field of flowers. Field of flowers. A sunset on one side and the moon on the other. Okay. <laughs> oh, but that, does that invoke a season? Do we know what season of the year it is? Well, there's spring. A flowers is spring. Probably spring, right? If it's a whole field. Right? Maybe, summer. maybe summer. Yeah. Maybe summer, but a lot of time. Uh, and the other two things we see? The sun and the moon. Yeah, have, you have noticed that before, right? You've seen the moon out. So they, they have it sort of illustrated that way, right? Did you picture those sort of flowers? I mean, to ask you, other classes said they saw sunflowers. You saw those? Okay. Those, those Japanese flowers. What are those? Is that? And boy, you're sneezing. Your allergies kick in. The haiku and sijo are both imagery based. So I wanted to see if in their mind's eye they could picture uh, what was being described with words. Um, and then even uh, using a, a haiku book for children, I would read the haiku out loud with their eyes closed and see if they could imagine the picture that the artist had uh, created in the book and to see if the image in their mind also matched up with the image in the picture. All right. So before I uh, launch you out uh, to write your own haiku, um, let's, let's go over what a, what a haiku does. Okay. It's almost always about nature, and I want you all to start there. You can write haiku that are not about nature, 
uh, Michael said he wrote a haiku about soccer. I, ha I have I have a, a, a list of a basketball haiku somewhere. Maybe I'll leave those up for you. Um, it usually, traditional haiku usually says something about a season. Sometimes those sejo seem to invoke a season as well. Written in the present tense, and it's usually just a single image, a moment in time. Now, I think we saw some sejo that had titles to them. And if you want to, uh, when you write your haiku and eventually when you write your sejo, uh, you can give them titles as well. It's not part of the syllable count, but it'll help the reader focus on uh, what the words are described. So here we go. Spring mountain biking. Pedaling through trees. The smell of honeysuckle. Flash of wildflowers. Is that, is that, they, I originally, see this is what, this is what, um, this is why it's good to play around with short poems like this and really think about the words that you've used. Yesterday I showed you this to class, and this, being in the second line, I had odor of honeysuckle. That's two syllables, right? It fits there, right? It makes it seven syllables. Okay, yeah, that's what they yeah, said. That that's what they said yesterday, too. You can't use odor. Odor's bad. Right? The, con the connotation of odor is negative. The smell is better than odor. I didn't think odor was bad. Because we associate that with body odor. Yeah. <laughs> you have a bad odor. Um, so, this is what I want you to try to do here um, in class. If you have a, a piece of paper handy. And you're eventually going to write three of these. But I want you to try and create a haiku. Try to, um, try to invoke a season and try to include an outdoor activity that you enjoy. And on just the first one. You're, we're going to try to write one right now. See if you can create just a haiku. And if you want to title it, right? My quick school if, if I took that title away, would you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Not mountain biking, but... Yeah, pedaling through trees. Pedaling smell honey honey trees. Right. How fast am I going? Yeah. I'm going really fast. The Flash. The Flash, that's right. Okay. So let's see if we can... Okay, so should be nature, season, present tense, a single image. And try, try to make it around an outdoor activity. Get, give your give your haiku some action, because eventually we're going to take our haiku and try to make a sejo out of it. And so, as we've seen, sejo are longer, and they tend to have some sort of some sort of action. have attempted haiku. Here is uh, Jack Kerouac, famous beat writer from On the Road. Is, it, is that a haiku in English? Snow in my shoe, abandoned sparrows. No. Why is it not a haiku? What can it be under? Or does that have to be 575 exactly? Trying to make yours 575 exactly. Well, but, but the explanation here says, when translated in Japanese, the haiku has a precise syllable count. He wrote that with Japanese it's also not very oh, right. beautiful. <laughs> you know what? I like that. <laughs> Snow in my shoe, abandoned sparrow's nest. No, you don't like that. That really does invoke winter, doesn't it? Oh, there's the other one by uh, Richard Wright, who's a famous novelist. White caps on the bay, a broken signboard banging in the April. Done yet? <laughs> Six times. Activity. Mine's cool. Something for me. One line. He's got the creative process. Oh, okay. He's, I mean, like, I mean, like, another day. <laughs> another day. 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 Another
24 hours. No, I didn't. Well, give us three Here we go. We got This is where you got to think. Sing a song. That pays the bills. Can you? But it pays the bills. That's kind of repetitive. Can you, can you say something, something different? I couldn't think of my Yeah. What is, it? is that supposed to be? Trudge? Trudge. Wow. Trudge. 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 Listen here. Outside basketball court. Gotcha. Oh. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read, read Sophia's out loud. So oh, I thought I had it. Well, I'll, I'll read yours in a second, too. Since we made it really good. Okay, I'm going to read it without the title. She gave it a title. See if you can figure out what's going on. Unbalanced <laughs> waters, gripping the oar while falling. Smooth rapids ease tension. White water. White water rapids. He says kayak. Kind of same thing. Because you got the king say paddle. Yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. This this may be the best one yet. It was sort of a collaborative effort, though, right? <laughs> Gulls swirling above. Children scream and the waves crash. Grab your board. Surf's up. <laughs> that could shut up. Like, is that a Beach Boys song? Beach Boy Haiku, what do you think? I never listened to the Beach Boy. Anybody else have a good one? Poetry, in its essence, is supposed to be spoken aloud. And so if they can hear poetry uh, read properly, read out loud, I think it gives them a sense of how to put it down on the page better. So if they hear someone read a poem, uh, it's another way, another way for their mind to, to wrap their mind around the poem. Um, and not just, if, if you read it just on the page, sometimes it's kind of flat, but I think poetry should be read aloud. And I always like to go around and grab students' poems and uh, when they're least expecting and read the poem out loud to class, if I think it's a good one, so other students can see um, how, um, how someone else is doing, how they're attacking the problem. And uh, I think that brings encouragement to students when they can see, oh, well, they can do it, I can do it too, so. I want you to I want you to write three three haiku. We'll start with that. That one counts as one. That one counts as all it started. You don't have to title them. If you now, everyone listen listen. If you want to title them, uh, you can. But sometimes you can just let the image stand for itself. So. Um, one other thing you can think about, because people do Cijo this way. Look, here's three Cijo in a row. They are linked together. They're telling a story. My, my brilliant idea, nobody will, nobody will ever buy it, and I probably won't write it. I'll go crazy. Could I write a whole, could I write a whole novel just using haiku? Why would you torture yourself? <laughs> no, I don't know. I get bored in the summers. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But could you write three haiku that are kind of Related. linked together and that might tell a little story? That might be something to think about. We're going to take these haiku and again try to take the basic image of the haiku and turn it into a seizure. So I'm going to read you some more. Oh. This is not the sad one I was thinking about, but here we go. I like you, Bamboo. You are a true friend. When I was young, I played on stilts with you. Now that I am old, you stand outside my window, waiting till I need a walking stick. And is that pretty sad? Where's the other one? There's another good one about gray hair. Okay, oh, see if you can figure out this one. This is kind of a bit of a puzzle. All right. The great bear has moved across the sky, but the moon is still visible. I cannot tell how far we've rode, but I know the night is fading now. The wind whispers of women beating clothes. I guess we must be almost there. 
The great bear has moved across the sky. It's like a constellation. What's 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 the great bear? I'm not sure. Ur Ursa Major is another name for. The Great Bear. No. Bear. Big Dipper? Mm. Y'all not heard that? Big Dipper? Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Butterflies playing happily in a hundred flowered garden. Can you see that? Can you see that image? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beware. Though each fragrance lures you, try not to light on every flower. All right, so can we? Um, we've got this. We can. We can come back with three haiku. Yeah. Three solid images. We're good, and then we'll we'll go more into about seizure next time. Most students seem to be a little um, scared, a little concerned that they have to write a longer poem than a haiku. Um, but I think by beginning with a haiku and writing a haiku they learn that um, you know, they can write a shorter poem and in the next lesson, the next day, I lead them into writing a longer poem using um, similar ideas, similar images they used in their haiku. All poetry is imagery based. So haiku is a basic image that you create. So the first day I have them uh, for homework, I have them write three haiku that's, that's in traditional format where they talk about nature, it's written in present tense, and it just captures a single image on paper. <laughs>